land. Okay. Okay. And land training and planning and design. She now works with the Idaho Transportation Department in environmental compliance. I'm so happy you're doing that. And Alyssa has a habit of randomly um, native flowers and committing other acts in gorilla garden around town. In Potlatch, where she lives, or in uh, Pocatello, where she lives. We also take note of the clarity and beauty of her photography. Alyssa, thank you and welcome. Thank you for having me here to talk to you all. Um, 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 this is one of my favorite conversation topics. So I think I'm with uh, kindred spirits here. So thanks for having me. I'm gonna um, uh, try to get my slideshow up here. Okay. Question is, do I do, are you guys seeing that or no? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So go down to share. Share. There we go. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right. Great. Um, things in my way. Scoot that over. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay, everybody? Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, uh, my title of my talk today is Thinking Outside the Green Box, and that um, I was talking to um, Penny about what people were interested in, and obviously Native Plant Society, you guys are um, have a leg up on the general public. Uh, because you are aware of what native plants are um, and uh, what role they play in our landscape. So that is a great starting place for us tonight. Um, as uh, my background, uh, like I was introduced, I um, started out in biology, studying plant insect interactions and uh, kind of uh, got more involved in what uh, was happening at that urban in, in interface and then um, eventually went back to landscape architecture and planning school and here I am uh, really happy to be in Idaho and um, and I've learned a lot since I've been in the state. So I'm going to start with um, let's see just saying that today I have um, been looking at your website, the White Pine website, and I'm really impressed with all the information that's on there. I, you guys have really um, done a lot of work with that, and uh, I learned a lot just reading what was on your website. I haven't spent a lot of time up north, so um, uh, it was nice to see that a lot of the plants um, I recognize, so I'm not totally out of my depth here. Um, and uh, so today what I wanted to go over, um, since you guys have so much information and are knowledgeable about plants to start with, I'm not gonna go through like a catalog of plants today. I would like to go over something that I think is a little harder for us to wrap our head around. And that is how do you go about um, seeing uh, what you should do in, with a landscape? And uh, so we're gonna talk about some concepts and some of the things that we bring with our own um, experiences and our, our travels, uh, kind of our perceptions and, and um, expectations to what a landscape should be. And then maybe some tools about how we can um, kind of take what we have and, and make it something that we want. So, um, First, I want to start with something that we, it's kind of a starting point for a lot of us is these kind of general yards that we have. And so I wanted to ask you guys some questions about what you're seeing here. And that is, um, 
Uh, so what do you think, what you're looking at here, you should be seeing a, a backyard of a kind of a normal house. What do you think led to the decisions to make the landscape like this? And you can either talk or um, say it out loud. You'll have to <laughs> unmute to say it out loud. Easy to maintain. That's what I, I grew there's... up with in the, from the, in the Midwest. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what we've seen. Um, there's also I community think... pressure in some areas. Mm -hmm. Good points. What else? It's easy for the builder to install. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's easy to get those materials. They're fairly common. And sometimes the soil is not very good because they've um, they dug everything out from the subsoil ended up on top. Right. It so looks the same all the time. You don't have to worry about messy looking plants going to seed or deadheading flowers. Yeah, so it's this, easy. This is, this is Steve Love. The, one of the things that uh, that I always think of when I think of a big lawn like this is that big lawns came as a result of very wealthy people in Europe, and yes. <laughs> other people visited. People from the United States went and visited there, and brought that idea back. And and now it's just kind of a it's an ego thing. It, everybody wants to look like the wealthy, and so. That's, that's how lots got started in the United States. And we've just kind of stuck with it. But a lawn, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of lawn, but, but the problem is, is if you're trying to create habitat, a lawn is, is worse than a desert. There's just not much support for anything but a few insects that actually eat the grass. Yep, all, all good points. And, um, you know, it's all, those are valid reasons to have something like this. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So my next question is, how does this, looking at this, if this was your space, how does that make you feel? What are some of the things that you would feel if you were walking through this or hanging out back there? Depressed. <laughs> Bored. <laughs> A lot of work. A lot of work and a lot of water use. Yeah, water use is that probably takes a lot of water. Bland. Yeah, it's not super eye catching, I guess. Expensive. So, my last question about this slide is um, where is this? Where is this slide taken? Do you think? It could be anywhere. <laughs> exactly. So that that's that's the um, point I wanted to make is that um, we don't know where this is, and I actually don't know where this is either. I got it off the internet, so um, I thought it was funny because it kind of reinforced the whole idea of uh, of could be anywhere, um, maybe some place with some sort of winter climate, because we can see some of the trees maybe just be leafing out. But other than that, it's not super um, uh, noticeable. And, and so what I wanna, the first design concept that I wanna in, in, talk about today is the idea of, um, I can make it, is this idea of geni genius loci. Have you guys ever heard of that? It, it's a ancient Greek, term that um, where they developed their amphitheaters and their worship sites, um, they felt that the, they had a spirit of place and it inspired um, um, them to feel a certain way. And it was driven by what the land itself was. It wasn't what they were bringing to it. They were responding to what was in the landscape. And and so thinking about that picture we just saw and the idea of, of genius loci, um, I wanted to ask you, okay, so now 
think about some of the that same question, those same questions um, that we were thinking about in that first slide. What is this slide? You know, where do we know where this is? Maybe we have a better idea. Hawaii, yeah, definitely. It's very distinctive. It um, has a uh, very characteristic vegetation. There's native materials that have been used into the structure. Yep, yep, this is on the big island of Hawaii, so you guys are right. So this definitely has some personality. Um, so what about this one? Any guesses on this one? Pacific Northwest. Yeah, this is in the um, redwoods in Northern California. And this has a, does this make you feel differently than the, the, um, the first picture of Hawaii? Like, you, like to me, this is, I could even hear the differences of what um, the wind might sound like here versus that, that, um, that lava strewn beach in Hawaii. So these are very evocative uh, places that have distinct um, feel to them. And what about this one? Any guesses on where this is? Arizona, yep, this is the Southwest. So we know that there's, there's a, a, um, materials, this rock wall, um, the way that, that that building was made that has a very distinct feel to it. So all those things, come together and um, and that's what I want you guys to think about as we're going through this today is, is what do you feel like is your genius loci and what are the things that are meaningful and, and um, interesting and, and uh, compelling about you know these pictures like how can you look at that when you see the place that you live. And one of the things that we were talking about, um, earlier about, you know, do we know where this is? Where is, you know, what does this monoculture tell us about, you know, how we feel about where we live? Well, my challenge for you guys is to find that genius loci for where you're at and, and bring that back to um, where your landscape is. And going back to what Steve was saying, um, you know, it's it's valid to, you know, anything that we carry with us, you know, it's with us and it's part of our, how we think about things. Um, and uh, Steve was absolutely right. A lot of what we get with our, um, the turf grass phenomena in our country has to do with um, the development of, uh, landscapes by the what back in the day would be the the old time one percenters and um, they didn't have to use their property to grow food and they had people to take care of it so there was these kind of uh, luxury items of of uh, turf lawns and um, it turned into if you couldn't um, have that then you were not part of the um, well-heeled, well uh, well-bred, and you were seen as poor and just not a good person. So there is this kind of moral turpitude that is tied up in what our grasses means to our houses today. And, um, and that I think was why people get so upset about like if their neighbor's lawn is not the way that they want it. So those are some biases that we bring to what we want to see. And then the other thing is there's a lot of um, uh, marketing that goes along with what to do with things that are outside. We want to control it. We want to 
make it the way we want it. And um, so that's that's part of it too. But if we can we can be realize that you know our reactions to things come from these 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 peer like somebody said peer pressure or um, these things that we've seen in the past. We know that our reaction isn't that because it isn't because it's bad. It's just because we've been taught that it's bad. So if we're aware of that, we can we can kind of pick that apart and find uh, a new path um, and be more creative with what we have on our on our palette. And so um, this is a shot from near where I live in Pocatello. And so this is, when I look at this, I'm, um, you know, this is my way of thinking about genius loci is looking at these hills, these dry sage hills and the topography in the valley bottoms. And, and part of that genius loci is meaning that we can learn from what we're looking at. We listen to it, we can accept it. We wanna become part of what we are instead of changing it to something else. And I think that's just such a inspiring way to, to move through um, the landscape, especially when we live in such an amazing part of the world. So, um, so how do we do that? It seems like there's a million and one things to change or to think about, and it can be really overwhelming. So what I would want to start with for design ideas um, in a more specific way, it's kind of the same thing as when you make a New Year's resolution and you're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get in shape. Um, but they say, well, that's kind of hard to do that because you don't have any specific items to tackle. So that's the same thing with what you'd want to do with your landscape is um, think about what you want. And that might take some thinking. I mean, the idea of um, looking around you and looking at your native uh, landscape and your genius loci is one thing, but there might be some activities or life um, patterns that you need to accommodate that is part of your goals. Uh, and then, so that's what you want, but you also have to know what you have. So what, what's in your um, treasure chest now? What's missing? And so those are the two things you'd wanna make some lists about. And sometimes it's a list, sometimes it's a map where you, you write things down on, uh, but that's a really great place to start. So let's talk about goals for a second. And it's what I like to think of um, when I get overwhelmed with a big space is, is to kind of think of it as the same way you do it inside your house. It's like you have rooms that you want to do specific activities in. And um, so you can kind of think about that in your outside too. So I have a, a backyard. Um, I do have one a little bit. Um, so I, I, um, I use it to good effect, or at least my dog Lily does. And uh, so that's an activity that I had in my list is like, I need a place for my dog to sleep during the day. Um, there's also, what, what do I wanna feel when I'm back there? Do I wanna feel energized? Do I wanna feel secluded from the world? Do I wanna see the vista across um, the valley or, um, so those are, I, you know, what are their goals um, that you would wanna achieve with that? Uh, comfort, safety, and upkeep are already are all kind of intertwined. Um, you want to be sheltered from the bat, the really strong winds, or you know you have a um, a uh, really sunny side of your house, which is awesome in the winter, but not so awesome in July. So. <clears throat> thinking about, um, you know, do you need to adjust that? Do I need to make sure I have a gate on my backyard? Um, do I need a walking path that I can get around on safely? Or um, how much am I gonna be able to put toward keeping all this up? Can I afford to hire uh, help with it? Or do I have to do it all myself? And 
um, you know, I, well, I personally have bad knees. So, you know, how much is that going to affect my ability to maintain what I have? And so all those kind of get wrapped into um, a goal list. Uh, in, in particular, I would say, you know, if we're talking about um, native plant landscaping and addressing, uh, you know, the endangered landscape of the Palouse, or somebody said they needed to, um, if somebody mentioned the water use, you know, those are all parts of like, how do we decide what is our preference in um, how we use resources in our landscape. So that goes into our goals. And somebody else mentioned erosion control. So that would be an issue that, you know, that's a problem we want to address. Um, so our goal would be to have a stable slope on one side of our house or, you know, make sure our deck doesn't fall down because it's anchored in a steep slope or whatever. Is there any thoughts or questions about where we're at with this right now. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to have some quiet time and um, write down what you want. And then if you have any other people in your family that are sharing that space, they probably need to come up with stuff that they feel is in a, are important goals for them. So you can dovetail those. Okay. And then, so, and this doesn't have to be in order. I guess you can do goals first or inventory first, whatever gets you moving. <coughs> Excuse me. So this, um, this is an example of an inventory that is kind of done in a map style. And I like these because, you know, space is, well, it's spatial. And so you have, um, layout and it's kind of a 2D, 3D thing. And so it's good. I, I like um, doing the brainstorming on a map. And you can see here um, this map that this person did, it has some basics. It's what is the property, um, some small distances um, or notes on some small notes on um, the distances they have, you know, what are they, what rooms are they looking out the window from and at? And where are this, the sun going to be? Um, they have here, they want to maybe screen some views. And so that's how you start building your inventory. You want to have your physical environment described and that is built stuff. Um, like here it has some stairs, it has a garage and a driveway. Um, you wanna talk about your climate. So this one has, um, you know, cardinal direction, sun direction, wind, um, and you might have a summer and a winter one if that's a big um, difference to how you're using your yard. Slopes are important, especially for drainage and for you know, if you're planting plants on a south facing slope, that's going to have a different climate, microclimate than north facing slope. I say north and south, those are two different things. Um, and you might have some constraints. You might have a gas line that runs through your yard, so you can't really dig there. Um, you might have a big fence line on one side. And so note all those things and how you're gonna get around your yard. I was talking to a client, she had a big hill in the front of her yard and um, a big retaining wall on the other side of her house. She couldn't get a wheelbarrow or a, a little lawnmower, a riding lawnmower on, from her front yard to her backyard. So she needed to do some earthwork in order to change that. So how are you gonna get around your yard? Do you wanna have a total circulation path all the way around or however it is. So, um, and then you can list all those out and then you start to see patterns of going back to your goals. You know, if your goal is you want to have a nice place to have your 
morning, maybe you work from home and you want a morning workplace outside. Well, your inventory, you've talked about where you have your sun in your shade. And so you might have realized from your inventory that you had been thinking the only place for sun is um, maybe in one side of your yard, but maybe you have a little corner somewhere else that you could develop. So you start putting the building blocks together for that. Now you can um, achieve your goals with what you have. And then you also identify what you don't have. Um, so maybe you say, okay, well, I really would like to be able to um, walk from my side yard out to the back alley so I could put the garbage out or something. And you don't have a, a path there. It's all shrubs and uneven garden. So now you've said, okay, I, I think I've identified that I do want a walking path on this side of the house. So that should be pretty straightforward, but um, uh, I think it's pretty important to be able to know what you have and to know what you want in order to pick out how to fill up the space that you have. Okay, so now that we have kind of the practical things in mind with our goals and inventory, um, how do we get to something like this, um, which is my friend Hannah's yard. She's uh, got really awesome instincts. And so she's um, put together this phenomenal native plant garden here in Pocatello. And um, it could be mind boggling to think, okay, if I have just a square of grass, how do I get to this? So um, we have our starting list of what we want and what we need, but we wanna make it um, speak to us. We want that sense of, sense of place and something that we love to look at. And that's where the, some of the design principles come in from, um, from the art world. And we'll talk about that for a minute. Is there any, before I jump into that, I actually, um, is there any questions about the, the goals and inventory section? Okay, just put them in the chat if you have any. Okay, so, um, so this is a, a, a pretty good list in a nutshell of a bunch of tools you can use to lay out your um, your landscape to make it make sense and to be interesting and to create a sense of ambiance. Form and void has to do with um, positive and negative spaces. Scale is um, the si relative size of things. So the size of the space versus a person, the size of a house versus a person, or a size of the wall versus the open yard. Balance is um, how you line up things. So do you want an asymmetrical um, space? Do you need something very uh, balanced where you have two on one side and two on the other? That's kind of a formal uh, symmetrical balance. Color and texture are pretty familiar concepts. Color obviously is what color things are. Texture is um, the materials, are they, are they soft? Are they hard? Do they have really sharp lines? Do they have really fuzzy look to them? And you can use those in different combinations uh, to create a feel for what you want. And then um, where the magic happens is these last two things, uh, unity with variety and mystery with legibility. And we'll talk about those in a minute. So here's an example of, uh, um, oops, sorry. A sculpture in a public plaza. Has anybody ever seen this? This is in Chicago. It's called Cloud Gate. It's this great um, sculpture, but it's um, in this big open space in the middle of all these tall high rise buildings and then which are very geometric and very classic. And then there's this amazing organic metallic shape that um, 
is you can walk around it, you can walk under it, and it's very different from um, the very distinct. So that is a really good example of how you have um, these big, some shapes to fill in the space and they may contrast and they have different forms. So you, if you like, like really um, uh, classic uh, linear spaces, you might go with ge geometries that are like squares or lines or rectangles. And if you really like kind of uh, um, organic shapes, you do kind of curves and, and, and um, irregular surfaces. And then here's a, um, I also have scale on this form on this slide. And so you can see the people are dwarfed by this giant um, shape. And uh, it's this big outdoor space and it makes it feel very festive because a lot of people can come together and they're, they're feeling um, very juxtaposed as a small person against this big thing. Now in a, in a personal yard, you, that's, that's, this is kind of a public plaza type scale. In a, in a yard, you don't wanna feel exposed like this. You wanna feel cozy and secure. So you want to have more um, a ratio where your, humans, your human body is a bigger percentage of the open space. So um, if your front yard looks as big as this plaza, it's gonna be hard for you to feel comfortable there. So you might think about breaking up that space into smaller quote unquote outside rooms. So that's what that scale will help you do. And then again, you don't wanna like a giant wall or your, you know, the side of your two story house that doesn't have any windows on it right there. Cause that's really a mismatch of scale. Okay, and then um, point line and plane um, are just shapes that you can use to play with um, creating patterns. So he here's a, um, the, on the right, there's a garden that has a use of, it uses dots, basically these little shrubs and they lines them up in a line and then it makes a flat space between them and they put this pond and it's made like this, floor type of surface for the garden. So that's a way of using point line and plane um, to, and then you're looking at the distance, um, there's stuff in the, you know, there's other points and other lines to look at behind there. And then balance, this is an example of asymmetrical balance on the left where it's in balance, but nothing's really the rocks are different sizes and there's a different number of rocks in one side than the other. And then on the right, you have an even number of um, shrubs on each side. So that's an example of a symmetrical balance. And then again, you are all probably really familiar with color and texture. Um, uh, you know, this is an example of, uh, blue and orange, which is the opposite colors on the color wheel. So it's kind of makes an interesting contrast. You could play with where the colors are more similar to each other, like blues and greens, and it makes it more um, calming. And then this is just a crazy texture from a geothermal site in Southeastern Idaho. And so I just wanted to put that out there. You might have textures that you're working with on stone paving or brickwork. Uh, how, different types of wood, grain, um, the slats in your fence, even the size of the leaves on your plants create texture. So there's lots of ways to play with that. So getting to um, kind of more these um, uh, these synthetic these these uh, sophisticated concepts that kind of bring it all together. Um, one is called unity with variety, and that goes back to someone who was saying that they were bored with that picture of that lawn um, at the beginning. And the way that we find interest is that we, we have different things, but not so different. Like every, if we had a hundred different plants and they are all every single one different, there's no way that our brains could appreciate them and comprehend them. So having repeated patterns, but with little differences, but still kind of the same, 
makes our brains happy. We can say, oh, like in this picture, all the red tomatoes, oh, those are awesome tomatoes, but I really like how the red tomatoes look different than the other little round tomatoes. So if you think about that with the elements in your yard and that you don't want um, a bunch of different things, uh, you want something that you can repeat. I mean, maybe we do want a lot of different things, but we might all have different tolerances for that. I have a friend that says, well, I don't, I don't want, um, you know, I don't like um, organic lines. I like things in a row so I can look at them all. Um, and I like them the same. So that is very satisfying to her, her aesthetic. And um, you guys just know that you just find a way to um, find out what you like to look at and then represent it slightly different ways. Okay, and then the other thing is mystery with legibility. And that has to do with our innate curiosity as a species. We like to um, feel comfortable, but adventurous at the same time. So um, if you have too much mystery and you start to feel unsafe, then you don't wanna be in that space. So the key is to find, um, something that draws you in, but in a way that you still feel happy and you wanna go explore. So this picture of a gate with a little peaky hole in it, and then um, you know that, oh, this is where I go through the door to get through this place I can't see through. That is a, a legible way to navigate the landscape. Okay, so here's, here's the pop quiz for you guys. So I can stop talking and you guys can start talking for a minute. Um, so out of all those concepts I just went through, what, what do you guys see here in this picture that's represented in some of those design elements? Anyone? Purple unity and variety. Okay, yeah, so there's some balance of colors. Okay, yeah, the building in the background is mysterious. You kind of want to go check that out. There's definitely some different textures. We've got some soft textures and some coarse textures and those kind of balance each other out. Yes, vertical lines and puffy blobs, exactly. <laughs> it's a really simple, but uh, like, yep. I mean, that's what we're seeing there. And it's, um, you can see the, the spiky pink things are very different than the rounded, looks like Joe Pye weed or something. And, um, but they're the same color, even though they're super different. And then they reflect that color in the back um, too. So, uh, you know, that's how we, good job, you guys, you were paying attention um, and you're getting kind of the gist of, of what I was trying to convey. So you can take these tools kind of separately and mix in and match them to try to create the feel that you want. In this picture, it's got a lot of um, fuzzy textures and, um, and that kind of makes it feel kind of um, romantic and lush. So it, and if you did something like on a straight sidewalk with really spiky yucca plants, for example, that would be a very modern, different kind of um, edgy look. So there's ways you can play with those different elements um, to create a feel. And I wanted to take just a minute to talk about plants. Um, and I know that you guys are, are, are again, you know, you're um, more versed in plant um, information than a lot of audiences. So it really just comes down to the right plant in the right place. Um, pick, uh, do, 
you know, if you see a plant you like, and or if you're you have a plant you know you're interested in having, and you want to put it in your yard, um, try to match what you have written down in your inventory um, to what the needs of that plant are. Um, and uh, I guess that's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to leave it up to you guys to do your plant research. Um, I think some of these other concepts are, are probably more um, new to you. So uh, go, you know, I, I'm confident you guys are familiar with that. So I'm just going to move on. Um, I did make an attempt at reading up on some different resources that talked about plants in your part of the world. And as far as the Palouse prairies go, um, I think what I came away with was um, really these, there's just a few main grasses. And I think it, from my experience at the um, highway department, they, they are mostly available, at least in seed. So like, we, we can get blue bunch, sandbergs, needle and thread, Idaho fescue, prairie dune grass, all these come, I can order these from seed companies, native seed companies. So those are available. Um, some of them might be available as container stock, like the Idaho fescue and the prairie dune grass. I think I've even seen some hair grass in pots. Um, and then the Forbes, um, these might be a little bit trickier to get a hold of, but um, maybe Steve has some ideas. He has done, oh, I didn't have penstemons on there. Oh, bad. I should have put penstemons on here too, but um, uh, you know, I've seen sticky geranium and some phlox um, and some buckwheats. You can start, you can order some of the asters. So I think you know, it, you might not be able to find every iconic species from the Palouse, but I think you could start to build um, kind of the basics from, um, you know, some grasses intermixed with some of these showy forbs. You know, you might be someone that really, really loves daisies and asters, and you want to focus on those over maybe the, um, the flax or the buckwheat. So, um, it's just, you know, really pick what you want, what you uh, gravitate toward out of that palette that you have. Um, I will say, you know, um, you are going to be working in your yard. And so you have, uh, you know, instead of a giant landscape of kind of rolling hills like you see out in the Palouse, you're going to be making that kind of in a reduced form. Um, and then you might have um, want to do some foundation plantings or, you know, meet some of those needs that you want to screen something from view or create a private place. You can use these, um, you know, some of the, the woody plant materials to kind of shape up that landscape and, and set up kind of uh, frame your house or your structure that you want to frame. So you know, even though the Palouse is a big wide prairie with some little nooks and crannies with woody material, I think um, you, you're going to try to take elements of those. Oh, uh, RM maple is Rocky Mountain maple. It's um, Easter glabrum. And I know, Penny, you told me to put the species names in there, but I just didn't have time. <laughs> so, um, but like I said, these are all um, stuff that's on your website already. So. Hopefully you'll track. Um, oh, and then the black is more like black text is like the drier slopes, and and then um, the green is kind of like kind of more mesic ravines or north facing, and then the blue is is kind of riparian bank or wetlandy type stuff. So it's kind of a gradient there, depending on what you have in your your property or feel like you want to water, I guess. And then let's see here. Um, so I don't um, really need to 
go into detail again. It's just a um, such a spectacular thing for me to think about when this diagram. I saw this diagram as like, um, boy, if you want to deal with erosion control, check out those root systems. I mean, just the fact that you're interested in native plants is going to get you a lot further than trying to lay sod and keep the slope intact. Um, so uh, one last section I wanted to go into um, before I let you go is the, the idea that um, you might be interested in uh, native plants primarily, but you can't have native plants or birds. Maybe you're interested in birds and wildlife, but you can't have those things without insects. And so I wanted to um, uh, kind of come back full circle to the title of my talk, which is that we are looking at um, seeing how we can welcome uh, insects into our yards as well as these plants in the in the beautiful animals that we want to see there too. And one of the things I think uh, is really a barrier to, to uh, kind of a broader acceptance of going to native plant landscaping or native uh, kind of more um, unstructured landscaping in general is mis misconceptions and, and lack of information about what is going on with the creepy crawlies and the insects and the spiders that are out there um, in the world. And we get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, consumer pressure to um, buy chemicals to control our landscapes. And, and we even use, even in kind of more enlightened conversations, we talk about beneficial insects or pollinator as like safe insects to talk about, but really, I mean, it's kind of like a plant. It's like plant isn't a nuisance until it's in the wrong place. Um, and the thing about insects is like insects are, um, you know, they're doing things out in our um, ecosystem. They're part of the food web. And uh, once in a while we get into a um, situation where we do have nuisance species, but for the most part, like, um, you know, they're out there, they're, they're making energy go up and down the food chain. Um, so hopefully when we go out and experience these animals, um, we have a sense of curiosity about them. And, and when we have a bad reaction, we, we, we lean into that idea and say, okay, well, I'm I'm having that thought and that feeling because I've been taught that, not necessarily because it's true. So what can we do to be more um, accepting to let these things in our space? And um, the very basic thing is just observe what you have. Um, there's lots of uh, easy ways to do that. Um, if you don't know what it is, take a picture of it and upload it to iNaturalist and it'll give you a good guess. <laughs> uh, there's some cool apps, Bumblebee Watch. Um, uh, anyway, uh, this so this little picture on the right, you may see um, these holes cut out of your leaves and your shrubs and your rose bushes. And um, this is actually an amazing creature. Um, it's a leaf cutter bee. And here she is taking a slice out of a leaf to go plug. They do uh, small nests and they just have little pollen pockets where they put their egg and they plug it with leaf. So, um, you know, you might've first saw that and said, oh my gosh, I have destructive caterpillars or something, but, um, you know, keep an eye out and you, you know, you might see this um, little bee um, doing its thing. Another example of that is, um, tomato hornworm, of course, um, the nemesis to some tomato plants. It also likes most things in the Solanaceae family, or a lot of them. And um, I spent a lot of time picking these off of uh, the tomato plants as one of my chores in the backyard. But um, turns out, you know, we learned that these are these hummingbird or sphinx moths, and they're 
awesome pollinators. Um, so we planted some four o'clocks and um, now they eat the four o'clocks and my parents are happy and the, we don't worry about the hornworms eating some tomatoes. Um, and then this is a little more of an obscure one. Hoverflies are um, awesome pollinators. They're bee mimics. Um, you can see that picture on the right. But um, when they're eggs, if you look at the aphids on the left, these little white rice grains are actually this larvae in the middle, um, which um, will, are voracious predators of these aphids. And, and they grow up to be these um, hoverflies. So there's lots of things in the garden. Oh, and then also, um, you know, there's lots of birds that eat aphids and stuff. So those are also not necessarily a bad thing if you see them in reasonable numbers. So be curious about what you're seeing um, when you're designing your garden. Uh, really think about what you would need to be safe and happy in your house. Well, the same thing you would think about for insects. You want shelter and safety from like pesticides or um, um, bad weather in all seasons. And uh, you don't wanna be changing your house every year. You wanna be able to rely on being able to come home to your house from year to year. So you want perennial resources. Um, you probably have heard the idea of trying to have plants that have blooming resources from early spring to late fall. And um, some of the stuff I've been reading is that you wanna have some sort of minimum area uh, which in ag, they're saying 5% of your farm, but um, you can apply that to your yard. I was trying to calculate that out and it's about 25 square feet in my yard, which is um, like way over that pretty easily. So that's not too hard to hit. Diverse flower shapes and colors attract diverse pollinators. And of course, any milkweed you can add for monarchs would probably be much appreciated. Although I don't know, um, you guys are pretty far north, but I think the whole state is listed as um, supporting monarch populations. So if you've seen one, good for you. All right, coming into the home stretch here, guys. Um, we're a little over, so this will be quick. Uh, one thing that happens when we do native landscaping and depart from our green box is that we get um, concerned from our neighbors and our homeowners associations and our city code enforcement. And one of the things that really helps shape that um, people being able to read what you're doing is to have what are called cues to care. Pretty straightforward. You have flowering plants and trees. I think we all have want that anyway. So any type of flowering element can help people say, oh, that, that's a quote unquote garden. Um, and then use some edging, whether it's a sidewalk or uh, one strip of mowed grass, um, and then all your naturalized plants on the other side of that, just to kind of help people recognize that somebody is here, somebody is doing something mind, uh, meaning or purposeful. And then adding um, details around that. Yard art, pergolas, bird baths, whatever it is. Um, and that makes people feel better that don't understand what a native landscaping in a front yard or a side yard or backyard is supposed to do. So in summary, just be aware of um, what you bring to the table, like why you feel about certain things being positive or negative, like maybe question where that comes from and see if that takes you in a new direction. Um, you guys are already thinking critically about what you want to bring into your yard, uh, native plants that are creating that genius loci and supporting your ecosystems where you are. And you're gonna be inspiring not only yourself, but the people around you, without a doubt. Okay, that's what I got for you guys today. Good luck.
what what else do you want to talk about? Thank you, Alyssa. Um, I think that we are open now for questions. You can either type them in the chat or perhaps unmute and ask Alyssa directly. Alyssa, this is Susan. I have a I have a question. I sure. have we have we have a and that we, we found in our yard that we have um, multiple native bees and bumblebees. And so we basically turn it into habitat. Um, so when we have somebody coming into the yard to work on it, like work on the sewer or work, put in windows or something, it's not uncommon for them to pick up um, something that I put in the yard, like a, uh, a dead tree. They'll pick it up and throw it out of the way or pick up, you know, just... <laughs> leave trash because to them a wild landscape looks like it's untended so it sounds like creating some bringing in architectural details like you said help people understand that it's a maintained space mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to look sanitized it doesn't have to look like you know like like a mode mode parking lot or anything like that right right yeah and it could be Maybe you you do put your little, you know, and it, it doesn't even have to be something that you feel as functional as like a um, a birdhouse or um, I have a little gazing ball that I put in an area that's pretty wild and woolly in my yard. And so um, that kind of anchors um, that space. Okay. Uh, so you can... Yeah, just be creative about, um, you know, you put a little bistro sit that you got that's super rusty and you don't even sit on it, but here you are, you make this little vignette around your, around okay. your, your natural area. Thank you. All right, Angela says you have three acres. How do you mature landscape while you're trying to get the things that are slow established? Yeah, that's... Yep. Well, phases, I guess. That's how the highway department does it. But um, uh, yeah, I suppose, I guess maybe you're doing all three at once or, I mean, can you, is that uh, where your property is? Maybe you could um, explain a little bit more. Angela, you could unmute and explain a bit if you wish. Hi, I was just wondering if you were a fan of Doug Ptolemy and his homegrown national park concept. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I guess I'm not familiar, so I'm going to check it out. Do you want to talk about it? Well, he's uh, he's an entomologist, um, and he's widely publicized. Got lots of videos, and he's very interested in the native plant, native insect relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, his focus is on uh, planting plants that actually attract insects. Hmm. Yeah, and I. Um, I was trying to read up on that idea of like, is there anything that we should be aware of when we're, you know, doing plant selections, when you are focusing a lot on natives, it's less of a problem. People um, tend to have, um, you know, if they're going in and trying to get these really uh, hybridized cultivars that have been bred for petals and have lost their anthers and so they don't have pollen or something like that, that's more of an issue, but um, you know, in my yard, I have a mix of native and non-native um, plants. I kind of just watched what was working. You know, I had a, I had a trouble with early having some plants that were blooming first thing in the spring, and I had some 
whoever was there before planted these um, Nanking cherries and they bloom like in February almost. They're so early. And, and so I just left them there because I, you know, eventually I got some creeping orb and grape in there and some um, kind of some other things, but um, you know, I don't, um, I try to, to watch what the critters are using and, and uh, try to go from there. So, but I'm gonna definitely gonna check out that website. Thanks for sharing. Um, and before, okay, so I see there's another question about clay soil. I'm gonna go back to the one about the um, three acres. I, I will say, you know, maybe just, you know, you're working on the bigger picture, but um, if you can pick a couple of priority focal points for your property, so maybe, um, you have three acres, which is a lot to do, but maybe you have, you know, right in kind of right in front of your house, like your walkway front stoop might be a place to start, or maybe you have like um, that one section that is not working at all. It's got dead grass and or whatever, you know, you have a problem spot. So pick some priorities to um, do some extra uh, attention to, and then the other stuff can kind of um, percolate along until it gets there. So good luck with that. Yeah, um, clay soil, secret to not smothering the roots in clay soil. Wow, um, that sounds tough. I I don't feel qualified to answer that question because I haven't worked with really heavy clay soils. Um, sounds like you're going in the right direction why planting natives like wet areas. I know that there's quite a few um, Midwestern plants that are specialized in clay soils, but um, not smothering the roots. Yeah, we, maybe we, somebody else yeah. knows. We mix. I mix a little bit of sand in with the clay or compost for both, just enough to give it an extra, um, make make it a little bit more porous and, and drain a little bit better. So, yeah, what, with, with, what, with what, the, one of the big problems with clay soils is they just uh, they're often in low places. Or flat places and they don't drain very well and so that's the real problem with them you can have heavy clay soils that a lot of our native plants will do fine in but you have to do something to get the, the drainage better and a couple of things you can do somebody already mentioned be careful putting sand in it you have to put sand in it. you have to put enough sand that it becomes a sandy soil instead of just a clay soil otherwise you just make concrete but um Organic matter, and a lot of our plants like organic matter. Some don't, and but so choose the ones that do. And then the other thing you can do is just mound it, um, create grade to it so that it'll drain off. And uh, then you can plant a lot of different things. Thanks, Steve, for the comment about the concrete. That explains some things. <laughs> uh see here. There's a question about grasses native to the Palouse. Mix of plants with a mix of rooting depths. Um, I don't necessarily know that you have to make an effort to try to find plants with different rooting depths. Um, I think just looking at what kind of typically grows together, they're sorting themselves out, I guess I would say, um, you know, if you have specific needs to stabilize a slope, um, there might be different rooting patterns that might be, you know, you might want more tap rooted or more um, branching depending on what you want. But I think, I guess if I was thinking about that question and I'm a, a lazy slash messy gardener, I would say, I'm just gonna let the plants sort it out. They've already figured out who likes to grow with whoever. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I hope that was an okay answer. Um, Thank you. All right. 
yeah. Um, what native species are you recommending for highway roadsides? Geographic differences. So, um, oh man, I could get super nerdy about this, but I'm gonna uh, try not to um, get too far into the weeds. Um, so we do a lot. So when you're looking at a roadside, we have um, kind of, depending on how wide it is between the edge of the pavement to the fence line. Like sometimes we only have like 30 feet or 20 feet and sometimes we have like 100 feet. So um, we have what's called the operational right away, which is the spot that is like right next to the road and it usually is between the gravel shoulder and the bottom of the drainage ditch that runs along the road. And that stuff is usually just grass. Um, just because it's heavily maintained and there's lots of herbicide spraying that goes on uh, for different reasons. And we have to keep it short for safety reasons and for fire control. And then further away, if we have the luxury of going you know, further away, then it really opens up to um, some different possibilities. Um, I will say that uh, given the size of a lot of the construction projects we do, um, we're kind of constrained by what we're avail what's available that's being produced by the seed producing market right now. So, you know, we usually can get things like blue bunch wheat grass, which is a real kind of very common standard species in a lot of places in Idaho or thick spike, which is more common in the really dry um, southern part of the state. And so I start with a few, try to get um, three to five native grasses. And then um, if I'm outside that operational right away, we'll do things like try to add some um, flowering plants and then hope that the, like rabbit brush and sage brush are pretty good about coming back into a place if we're we've got some hillsides around there it'll blow in so I don't try to put those in but um, that's kind of what I do um, we have a lot of legacy plantings on our roadways I did a survey a couple of years ago on some doing some transects and um, there's a lot of crested wheatgrass and intermediate wheatgrass that was planted um, decades and decades and decades ago that's still persisting. So a lot of that stuff sticks around a long time, which makes it really important. I try to make the argument to my engineers that um, we need to pay attention to what kind of grass goes in. And your friend is welcome to call me if that's a transportation person. Um, if we want if we want to talk shop about roadside reclamation, Are there, will you um, put your email in the chat in case oh, yeah, you yeah. want to follow up? That would yep. be wonderful. Thank you. Oh, and I wanted to um, uh, the pollinatorpartnership.org. Let me write that in there. They have these really cool. Um, regional planting guides for pollinators, which are pretty sweet. And then um, there's lots of cool planting um, guides from Xerxes and the, um, the different, there's a couple different monarch groups. There's um, main one is the monarch, monarch joint venture. And they do a lot of, um, guidance on their website about um, planting for monarchs, but um, you know, they're kind of a keystone species. So get something good going for that one, then it'll um, help with some of the other pollinators too. Are monarchs in Idaho? Yep. I had one, uh, I got to tag one that grew in my backyard this year. Oh, cool. Yeah. Pretty exciting. It hasn't been reported as found, but I didn't get to watch it be a caterpillar and then uh, turn into a butterfly. So 
and put a sticker on it. Go away. Wow, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And the fish and game has the whole state marked as a, you know, if you look at where is the, you know, potential monarch habitat, most there, it goes pretty far north. So maybe they'll dial that habitat model in more in the next couple of years because there's a lot more monitoring efforts going on. But um, certainly from kind of lower elevations where you guys are and then heading south, um, there's um, definitely monarchs around. Alyssa, thank you so thank much. You. Yes. Yeah, this. you're welcome. And I'm happy to send my slides to you guys. Um, I need to print them out into a PDF and reduce the file size, but I can mail you those and you can share them with your people if they want some of the uh, wordier slides. <laughs>